where we're at and where we're coming from. So I don't know how many people here have worked on it, any HPC systems with ARM or anything like that or familiar with uh, file systems and working with those kind of workloads and checkpointing and this kind of system. So DOE is interested in ARM. It's been exploring it as an option uh, due to its energy needs. So Luster is the parallel file system. It's the open source one. It's the alternative to GPFS on these systems. Um, it's the only option actually for ARM since GPFS is closed source and Luster is a completely open source project. It's been around for almost 20 years. Um, it started in the late 1990s or yeah, yep, 1990s and it's been going on ever since. You don't think of it as that age but that's because it was mostly an experimental project until the last like decade. And it's pretty much deployed on most of the top 500 systems in the world. It's the most common file system. You'll find it a lot at universities. Um, so, and it's an interesting project. So uh, various institutions are involved in this. So there's actually an institution very similar to what you do for ARM. It's called OpenSFS, the Open Scalable File System uh, Group. And it was formed after the Oracle acquisition of, of Luster. And the reason for that was because there was a fear that Luster would no longer be supported and it would disappear as a product. And this was the only solution. So all our HPC systems, we would all end up with GPFS. And, and it's not that GPFS is the most evil thing in the world or whatever, it's just IBM would really stick you with the price. And we didn't want it. We want to have, it's in the best interest of everyone that there's a diverse ecosystem. And actually today we have like... I'll let this story sell you. <laughs> We're owned by IBM, but I'm not participating. <laughs> <laughs> and this is true. Now we have even things like BGFS and other parallel file systems out there, Ceph, and things like that. So it's actually a much healthier ecosystem than it was many years ago. Uh, so, so we do have OpenSFS. This is an open organization. Anybody can join. It's extremely low cost. You have says in the or when you join, so you actually direct it. So we have something called the Luster Working Group, and I give the URL for that. And we have these biweekly phone calls, and everybody voices their opinions, what's important, and what the stage is. So Luster is a very user community driven organization. So whatever gets developed is what the community demanded. It's a very unique product in that way. Usually, I don't know if Lenaro is the same way. I'm not familiar with the structure of it. So who are the primary developers of this? So, so there is a core Lustre team. That team has gone from Independence to Sun <coughs> to Oracle and Intel, and now it's at DDN. <laughs> so there's a good chunk of the team. Uh, the team is much smaller than it used to be uh, over time acquisitions dwindle it down. But the good news is that, that the development has been moving away from just DDN. So there's other big players. Uh, Cray is highly active in the Luster community. Ornell is. Uh, we actually contribute a lot to Luster, actually, more than. Uh, and then Susan <laughs> has actually became a recent big player in Luster. So, so, there, so it's a quite healthy community. And then we get all these people from the sides that will send us specific things. They'll say, oh. On our university, we saw this, and this is a patch. Can you please see if it's right, and please make it work for us? And that's how it works. We have uh, open Git, and that's the URL. So if you want to download the software, it's open source, GPL. You can grab it, build it, install it, and that's it. It's, though I'm making it sound a lot easier than it really, really is. Uh, and I'm going to go over a little bit about that. So while Luster is primarily an x86 platform, we do do testing on this. And this is all the platforms that we have test, so internally in ORNL. So we had a SUSE 12 system. That uh, was our Cray prototype. So we get lots of prototypes that's incomplete hardware. And in fact, our ARM system is like a beta chip that has flaws in it. And we have to patch to work around those flaws because that's what we do. And we find all the bugs, we report it back to the vendors, the vendors fix it. They're not flaws, they're not features. <laughs> no, this is a flaw. <laughs> There's no arguing that. So one of them was our Cray system. It was a prototype with Ethernet only. 
So as soon as it ships with 4K pages, we put, this was our first system we put it on, uh, Luster with ARM, and it said, wow, it has no problems. It's, it's flawless. We were just flabbergasted for our clients. Then we got the next system, and it was a rail system, and it was 64K pages. It did not work flawlessly. <laughs> So we had to work, <laughs> yeah, so there was a lot of assumptions in our code about page alignments and things like that and that were very x86 centric and uh, so we had to go through that. Um, our current system is a Wombat system, we, that's what we named it. It's actually a open research and I, I will go over that, like how you can actually, we allow, you just apply for an account, we will let you on there. Um, it's a semi-production machine, it's where everybody's testing their things. Uh, it's heavily focused with applications. People are porting their applications to ARM there. They're reporting their experiences. And it's an IB-based machine. And then, of course, we also do the native Linux client support. Another project at Ornell is we support the upstream Linux client, and we've been working on that and getting that to be mainstream. And uh, I bring that up for a specific reason, so I've actually and I've actually tested, this is a joint project now with SUSE to make this a reality. Um, and I've tested on, the earliest kernels were 420, and now the latest kernel supported, and it's a 210 long-term release. Um, there are also others in the community that have participated in the ARM testing. So we've had uh, RHEL 8. We do not have RHEL 8 internally at the lab yet. It has to go through a very venting process before we accept it, so usually it takes us a while before we adopt a distro, where other institutions will adopt it right away. So that was the case for us. Um, so people have reported and said, hey, we got RHEL 8 working on our ARM platforms, and this is what we saw, and we collected that data. So we didn't do it. So now, as for WAM Cloud, currently they run the Alt 7, RHEL 7 kernels, but they're going to move to RHEL 8 as soon as possible, and that's going to be their primary focus. Because it's the same kernel, and it, it basically should be similar issues. So that way, it, it just makes maintenance a lot easier. And of course, then there's the Ubuntu 18 people. They come out of the woodwork, say, we got Ubuntu running with this. Uh, and, and usually, it's the Raspberry Pi people. I don't know why, but there's, there's this utter fascination of putting Luster on Raspberry Pis and doing clusters with them. I don't know why. I guess the universities, this is, this is their coffee money, you know, the jar, and you throw the money in, and that's how they make their clusters. But that's what happens. Um, so I'm going to go over the architecture of Luster and how it works and that. I'm assuming that nobody knows the details of Luster. I'm going to come from that perspective. This is a different crowd than I'm used to. So basically, Luster has a server client model. Um, and then on the clients are the basic front end, what you see and you run your applications on. The servers themselves have an OSD, what's called an OSD abstraction. So this is a unified layer. So the way it works is it uses a native file system like ZFS or ext4 modified. And it runs it on top of that. So it's used as an object store, the native interface. But then it's used in the to be used by the client. So you can actually mount the back end and see what the data structures are and things like that. So we currently support ZFS. That's actually the one that's most used. Everybody loves ZFS. It is the love child right now. The other one is uh, LDISCFS. That's what we call it. It's really XT4, but it's been modified to be scalable. And uh, so Currently, what is in this Linux kernel for XT4 doesn't scale as well as it could. There's a lot of work being done to upstream what we've been doing, and we've been getting there, uh, so we can actually do, do this kind of work. So down the road, probably a year from now, uh, EXT4 should be used right out of the box. You won't have to patch it currently. You have to patch it to make it work. Um, so. So that's the upper abstraction, and I have a nice picture that shows you. We have MGT and MDT. So we have these servers, and we break them up. So there's the object store data. That's your raw data in the back. And we call them object, ser uh, object store servers. And the, uh, and, the and the targets, which are your disk, are called OSTs, object storage targets. And basically, you see the same mirror. Our metadata is stored on a uh, different structure. 
And that's because, well, you get bulk data on one and lots of little packets on the other. Well, that's not entirely true. Now there's something called DOM. So little tiny files, uh, they can hurt performance going over the network along with your bulk data. So now we dump the little files on the metadata servers as well. Uh, and then we have our management server, which pieces everything together and tells you it manages the recovery and things like that. And of course, we have our luster clients, which are basic, your basic abstraction in the back. So it makes it look like a unified namespace with all these back end servers. So, and then all this is based on top of something called LNET, which is the luster network transport space. So it is a abstraction, so it allows your InfiniBand and your Ethernet all to work transparently with the same protocols on top. So we've created this abstraction and it uses a YAML configuration. So if you have one of these large systems with multiple um, network interfaces, you can actually bond them and send the traffic over them or you can do recovery pairs, all kinds of fun things like that. And we support routers too. And that was actually a discussion I had earlier about uh, optimizing that and you can use routers to optimize for the layout of your data and you can get the most out of your environment. So, so that's the basics of Luster. Um, of course, if you have questions, you can ask me later about that. So what about ARM? So now it works, actually. So about a year ago, at this time, it didn't work. <laughs> it, it, took quite a, it took quite a bit of effort. So the current target is 212. That's the long-term release. This is the actual functional unit. And I give the URL for that to get that out, um, download that, grab it as it is, build it, run it, servers at the same level. You don't have to do any hoops. It works. And it works pretty well. So just as a caveat, you can report bugs. But the official policy for DBN, WAM Cloud Division, is they only support RHEL x86. So that's all, their team is too small to support anything else. So it's up to the community to handle things like ARM at this point, um, and probably for the foreseeable future. So, but we have a very open community. You can send stuff. And uh, this is for Luster. This is the client I'm going over right now. I will go over the server as well. So right now I'm just ex saying about like where the client is at, and so. Uh, currently, ARM support for Luster is done by me. I'm the only person who does it. Um, so, and also, but the client has gotten to the point where actually, when the WAM Cloud division at DBN actually tests ARM clients now. Every patch that's submitted, it, they make sure it doesn't break something on ARM. And this is actually very useful because I don't know why ARM, like the Linux client, shows bugs that no one will ever see anywhere else. It does weird things, which are very interesting. Yes? What, what's your confidence in a lack of you know, rules knowing the world running bugs or something? That's, going to be that's, the, that's the funny bugs that we find when we do yeah. our testing. Yes, yeah. it's, it's usually memory barrier issues and things like that, and we've gone through those and, and fixed those. Those are pretty much resolved now. You think so? Yeah, that, that has been worked through. But yeah, I know which ones you're talking about. We did see those. So the regular SMB barriers are just the worst god awful thing. Yeah. Those are very intelligent centric and it'll break on. They're and very heavy as well. And, and they're very heavy. And, uh, and we've had some debates about using those because we, have you seen the SMP acquire and release stuff? And yeah. yeah, those are, those work flawlessly at ARM. And, uh, and then some people are at the school thought just use spin locks everywhere, and those are extremely heavy too. So there's been a lot of debate about that, but a lot of that has changed. And actually at LUG, we have a developer's day, and we were there, and I gave a whole presentation on how to use memory barriers and things mm -hmm. like that, actually. I'm confused about the client comment, because you actually announced the Ethernet guy as a supporter of the client comment. For DDN? I have been told that RHEL x86 is the only fully tested supported system. I mean, it's just they, they said they just don't have the resources to do like real support. We were, we were told it's only really fully supported at DDN and I was like, we can talk about this after, but that's the x86 public version. And so I, I, I hope that it's all going to be tested at DDN. So I'm just wondering 
Okay. Good. Like I said, if there's bugs in resolving, I'm the one that works on it. Okay. It's not like they o if someone opens a ticket, it gets assigned to me and I do it. It's not even for client. Even for client. Yeah. That that's what happens. I mean, it, it, I, I'm not being slight or anything. No, like, I, yeah, but and that they just said that it, it's just it's, it would be a lot of. At, they just feel that it would. It's a resource, mm -hmm. and they have limited hands and and other things. Um, so, but it is lightly tested, and it's tested by that is that the test suite is composed of many tests. So it tests the most basic test, the sanity test, and I'll go over the discussion of that. So the nice thing about that, now that it pretty much works out of the box, it's pretty good. There are some flaws. I know where the corner cases are, because I'm told what they are. Um, but it, for general use, it's gonna, you're not going to see issues. What we do see, and then uh, as you know, we're actually seeing deployment of these clients now. So Sandia, which I, I worked, uh, worked with them on that system, and of course at Orno, that's our Wombat system, and that's the URL if you want to get an account and play there. And then, of course, uh, the uh, ISM barred system at University of Bristol. They, when I went to SC last year, they said they were going to deploy a Lustre system. I don't know if they did or they didn't, but they said that was their, their plan to do that. So that's the client status, and it's actually pretty good. So what about the server status? So servers aren't tested at WAMCloud DDN. This is a community effort. Um, I have tested DFS. No additional regression. Any regressions are client-side bugs. Nothing. No patches needed. Just works out of the box. Um, you can use the 2.12 long-term release. Uh, the eldest DFS work, you need the latest tree. That's still an ongoing effort, um, but it's mostly done. So what happened here is because it's a newer kernel, there's something called the inode lock, and the inode lock used to be on the bottom of the stack. Then they did parallel lookups, they added it to the kernel and the VFS layer, that lock went all the way to the top. And now the lower uh, file systems actually look to see if this lock is taken. So it has caused a lot of, lot of problems. <laughs> Causes you can't mount it or that. So actually I had to flip the way Luster does the locking and migrate the locks up, and it, it was not a simple fix. It was a lot of code rearranging and stuff like that. So we're pretty close to it. It's like three patches away to land um, to do that. And of course, we have to support the Rails 7 alt kernels. Uh, I was delaying to support that because Rail 8 took priority, so Rail 8 just landed for server support. So I just have to redo our patches to detect uh, the RHEL 7 alt kernels. And I had something going. The only thing about RHEL 7 alt kernels and CentOS and Fedora, I saw people report, is that those kernels are completely inconsistent. It gives you heartburn. The CentOS kernels do not match. I found in my experience do not match the rel official alt kernels. Uh, there are some big differences and it caused, it's, <laughs> we had to figure out which kernels to support. That's why rel 8 is a, a way less problem. And there are no lock Still? So wow. Yeah. Yes, and uh, and because of the partnership with SUSE, one of the things we do is parallel directory lookups, which makes it much more interesting. And actually, uh, we've actually have a proposal how to do parallel directory lookups in the VFS layer and migrate it from LDISC. That's what we do, and and it also involves all that kind of stuff. And that's something we're going to push upstream probably this year. Um, and it benefits everybody because you can be able to do these large parallel lookups. But it is nice to know that we're not the only one. And maybe we might even beat SAP <laughs> to the punch. <laughs> okay. So when I do the testing, though, in our setup, which I have, um, it, it doesn't do any regressions once you have the fixes available. 
So that's actually really good. So it's only a couple patches. I know what the pro problem is, and I know how to solve it. It's a matter of just integrating it and making sure I don't break anything else. The pre-lock changes. So that's the server status. And uh, I really think this is going to be done within this luster, this luster release, probably a month or two, depending on, because the problem with luster is there's a lot of projects going on, and they all conflict. And that's what takes the longest to land this stuff. So, so what do we have on the ARM clients that's broken? So you can actually look it up. We have a filter, so that's the link. Or I have a ticket, and that's where everybody says, James, go fix that. So that's my ticket. And uh, so this is all that's left that we saw um, left on the clients. So we have the 64K page issues. That's probably the biggest thing. So there's something called the grant code. So the grant code is basically a way you have your OSTs in the back. They're X size. you got 1,000 clients going for it. Uh, the client tries to be smart and pre-allocate memory on the OSTs so that way there is enough reserve for you to do your write before someone consumes it. So, and you'll never notice this unless you do really, okay, so one time we created a Lustre test system with really thin OSTs that were like 100 megabytes. You will see this problem because it ate all the grants and we couldn't mount it even though the disks were only used like 10%. Because <laughs> everybody ran for that memory and the disk space and it was gone and there was nothing left, even though nobody could write to that space that they grabbed. And that's what grant space is. So you, you get a chunk, it tries to predict what you're going to do next. Uh, that code assumes the page size is 4K and there's page alignment issues. Um, that causes the most failures. So the grant code doesn't work. So it doesn't do the prefetching of the disk space. And that's probably the biggest issue left. And I haven't had the cycles to fix that. The others, uh, issue is we saw this write not cache and we don't know what it is but there's an IO page accounting going on in the code and we think that's another issue related to that. So those are the two bug uh, bugs that we have that we know of that are page related. Uh, there's also a, sometimes we have test defects. We know of this test. Um, the reason for this is it's a DD write and it does these chunks and if you don't do the chunks just right with 64K pages, it doesn't detect them. So you have to be aware that when you write these applications and that, to be aware of the page sizes and sometimes, especially with things like direct IO, that, that, that can really bite you if you think, oh, it's x86 or 4K by default. So that's a, so as you can see, there's not actually a lot of breakage. So what, actually the most problem problems is newer kernels. So uh, we see these same issues with RHEL 8 and things like that. So one of the things we see is that the portal RPC, there's a thread when you do the debugging kernel. So I test with debugging kernels. And I found that actually Sandia reported this. And I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. They put on lock depend. So, so some of the RHEL alt kernels that are being shipped by vendors, they turn on lock depend. Well, Luster's never tested with lock depend. Well, then there's a reason for that because of ZFS. ZFS doesn't work with lock depend, so it's turned off. But people who turn it on will see, will find problems. And, and I do my testing with lock depend, so we find these problems and we fix them. So one of the things is, is the thread, it's being called and it's, it's, being, it's sleeping in the thread and it causes issues. Um, you won't notice it's a problem except in very corner cases, but it can be a problem. Uh, the other thing is the FID handling. That's broken for newer kernels. Um, Luster has this concept of a FID. It's kind of like F handles. I don't know if anybody's ever programmed F handles. Like NFS, instead of doing a file and an open on a path, you can get a file handle and the handle tells you uh, it's a mapping to the real. You can open it by this handle. There's like a cookie. You get a cookie for a file. And you do this with NFS because the reason is because inodes don't match up you know, across clients and this is the universal thing. So Lester has a concept of a FID because the, to avoid inode uh, number clashes, it does this, it expands it out. And we do this. Um, there are problems with this because it's like a big giant database and the database doesn't work with what we call file sets or basically sub mounts. So sometimes we want to mount only a subdirectory of Lester and uh, 
well, no one has access to that, so that's broken. The other thing is to do this database, it does uh, decache violations, which I found out. Um, so you can get these circular buffers looking up some of the FIDs. So the, basically, um, the database is incestuous. Your mommy can be like your child <laughs> kind of thing. And it's in completely wrong. So that has to be reworked. And I'm aware of this. You see this newer kernels tell you, oh, this is your decache is corrupt kind of issue. Um, that takes, that's going to take quite a bit of work to make that work right. Um, there is also security violations. This is one of the fun things. So, so when we create sysfs files, we name it our OBD device, Luster dash MDC, which is the metadata character device, dash, and then some number. Well, that number is actually an internal f uh, pointer to a data structure, and that's considered a security flaw. <laughs> You're not supposed to expose like your data pointers to data structures inside the kernel to user land. So newer kernels actually really, really hate that. And, uh, and so I've been migrating it to UIDs, and, uh, and there's actually some benefit to that. So, so one is the device names will no longer be these function pointers. And the function pointers vary from platform to platform, too. And with UUIDs, I plan on making it so the UIDs, your luster mounts will have the same UIDs from client to client. Currently, that's not the case, because it's a, a, an address space pointer. So those numbers vary from client to client. So you can mount the same luster. and the data is different, so with UID, I would make it uniform across clients, and you know with luster mount one would be luster mount one, luster mount one on every client, the same number of systems. And this allows you to do things like what we do with when you plug in your USB stick. You can use the UID, and it'll generate, it'll have the same number, so it's consistent when you go to mount it. You get that same functionality now in other file systems. That's lacking, actually. So, see, so we also have test test frame infrastructure issues. So LNET self-test, we just can't get it run on uh, ARM or RHEL 8. There's something that's changed with the VM behavior, and it causes timeouts with it. And it's definitely something to deal with how the OS behaves with a VM. I don't see this issue. Most normal people, if you're running on direct hardware, will never see this. But in any case, it doesn't matter. I'm going to rewrite LNET self-test. A piece of junk, in my opinion, and I'm going to migrate it to Netlink and other things, and I'm going to change that. And there's reasons why, because I want self-test actually does artificial Netlink network traffic to measure the performance. I want to do it where it can hook up and monitor your your traffic in li on a live system, and tell you what's flowing and what it's doing. Um, the other thing, of course, is performance enhancements. So one of my little um, things that I love to do, and I test this with ARM, is noise reduction. Uh, the lab is very concerned with noise reduction. We do all kinds of fancy things with re, uh, my, uh, reserving cores just for Luster, just for kernel IRQs, things like that. Um, I also, so a lot, of the, a lot of the work was done to reduce the noise on that. So one of the phases that's almost done is the kernel timing mechanism. So the Linux kernel uses jiffies, and jiffies are based on the pit timer, which is does an IRQ every um, couple, what's it like a million times, I think, or something like that. I can't remember the number. But a clock drifts and all kinds of problems with it. It is the largest source of noise on, the, on, a, on, a, uh, on a system. So we reworked the timer to use the TSC that's on the x86. This happens with ARM2. It has its own clock sources. Um, it really reduces the amount of noise on a system, so it's actually a big win. Uh, same with CPU. Um, you put them in like CPU sets and luster and things like that. So, so that's a big concern. And noise is a big, big power drain actually on these systems. So. So that's the challenges for the clients. Um, I'm going to do that actually with the kernel threads and also the work queues. Work queues we're migrating to as well, and we're going to make them so they migrate to specific uh, CPU cores and run on those only. So that way it doesn't interfere with your jobs. Uh, the next thing is, uh, so that's where we're at. And as you can see, we have some challenges left, but it's much better than it was. 
than a year ago or earlier. Um, so what can we do? So now that we've reached this point, we want to resolve everything over the next several months. And then the biggest thing is right now, like I said, there's light testing going on. The, it is really in the interest of the community who people who this is important to, to actually become involved in the testing and doing larger scale testing. The full test suite. We have this whole entire test suite. Um, I gave a link to how to do the testing and how to report bugs. That's the link to report the bugs. They would be assigned to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that wiki link will tell you how to set up a test thing. Don't be afraid to ask questions. We have a Lester Devel. Um, oops, it's, it's Lester-Devel.org. But it is a mailing list. You can ask questions. People will answer, help you set up your test systems. We're willing to help you. It's a community effort. We're pretty good about this. Um, so you can also, of course, like I said, become part of the Lester Working Group. But you became part of Monero, and you have a voice in what you're doing. Uh, so you can do this, this kind of stuff. And uh, so, so that's the big thing is to increase the test scope over the coming year to make sure it's really hard and that we resolve any issues. Um, also make the Linux Luster client option. So there's going to be a native Luster uh, Linux Luster client. The plan is to land that by the end of this year. That's going to become a reality. That's going to be supported by SUSE and, and in cooperation with Ornell. And the reason for this is because ultimately the goal, we've discussed that, is to move, the long-term goal is to have the, the OpenSFS branch that, that's at WAM Cloud become a RHEL only and eventually migrate everything over all other distributions over to the Linux kernel versions that will be shipping with it. So it would, support would probably, be, support will shift from one version to the other, from one tree to the other. And that's, that's ultimately the goal. And then in the real long term, when RHEL, you know, after a decade or so, supports newer kernel, it will use this as well. And all the work will be moved upstream. Um, so that's your questions. We also have conferences. We have conferences all over the world. We have Lus uh, LUG in the United States. We have LAD, which is in Europe, which is actually happening right now at the same time as this conference. So there's something to think about for planning <laughs> in the future. Just in case, I mean, obviously it's not a large crowd for uh, this kind of thing. And then of course there's one in China for those people who do not want to fly from Australia to the United States and destroy their sleep cycle. <coughs> um, and that's the conclusions. As a, here's the conclusions. Like I said, we're seeing actual real life deployments. Um, everything mostly works. Server work is almost complete. Uh, and of course, we really need community involvement now. So people out there that have systems, don't be afraid to try it. Uh, don't be afraid to contact me. I'll help you set it up. This is the thing I do. I, I have no problem helping people. What's the test suite look like? What should the Lester test suite and server look like? So I test actually on three different hardware platforms. I test on x86. I test on Power 8, actually, believe it or not. I have those systems. And I also have, like I said, our main focus now is the Wombat system. So we have clients, and we got server boxes coming in, and they're being set up. So, and that's where I talked about the RHEL 8 issue. When we were setting up our ARM server boxes, we were kind of like, well, we want RHEL 8. And then our security guy said, no, you're going to have to do the alt for now, because you have to certify it and things like that. So, so our Wombat system is a Thunder X2 system. It's, it's from HPE. We got it from. <coughs> in fact, it's on the, if you go to the website. Yes? Uh, 
place to look at? So, I would say, hmm. So the, there's such a difference in characteristics and behavior. So the metadata servers, I mean, the MGS is, is, is a lightweight. It, it doesn't, you're not gonna get any benefit. It's, it depends on how many core systems you have. So on both MDTs and MD, uh, in the OSS servers and the MGS servers, you have a lot of threads running. Currently like a thousand threads, that's the default. The process of all the RPCs coming in and doing things. So with a large core system, this would help. The only thing is, I don't know how you do your NUMA systems. I, don't, I have to look to see. I don't know if you do crazy amounts of NUMA. We found actually new, the more NUMA nodes you have, the worse performance you get. You, you actually get a penalty on the server. Clients, it's the opposite. But the servers, you, you get more. So that's something to keep in sight of when you do configurations in that is to avoid systems with, you know, 20 NUMA nodes. Thank you. Could you explain the difference of the work that you're doing and the work that Neil Brown's doing from CISA? So my work, oh, you mean on the upstream client stuff? Yeah, so j just to clarify the two streams that are going on and... and so we went, there was an effort, so, so the story is a long time ago, there was a company called EMC that took the Lustre code and they put it upstream and we told them not to do it because it wasn't ready and they did it anyways and it gave us a lot of heartache <laughs> and nobody supported it. And then uh, I told my boss, I said, you know, we should really support this. You know, this would be to our benefit. Uh, it would just work out of the box. We don't have to do patching anymore. Um, you, you got the whole backing of distros to actually do the bug fixes in that. They have to become involved, so. And also the, the biggest problem with the Lustre community is it's a very small community of developers. We really need really great talent out there um, to work on Lustre. And we just don't have that. We're losing people. And that's one of our fears. And by expanding into the, the Linux community um, itself, we get to tap people like Neil Brown. Neil Brown is one of the VFS guys. Um, he's, he's one of the maintainers of the MD layer. Uh, NFS, he was a maintainer for many years. So uh, Suzu became interested and said, you know, how can we be a, not a second rate player in the Lustre community? And, and uh, Oleg, one of the, the Lustre gatekeepers said, work on the upstream client. And they took it up. So it's been a partnership with him. I maintained it for several years, and now he, we both work on it. So the goal is to, is to make it fully functional on newer kernels and, and actually bring it up to date with in sync with Lustre. So actually, I have a branch that's at 2.11, and the long-term release is 2.12, and we have a whole bunch of backports to 2.12. And uh, so, so that's that effort. Like I said, it, it'll become a part of the main stream kernel, so when you install your distros, you don't have to worry about installing external kernel packages anymore. It will be just there. Um, you just have to build your tools against, or get your tools for that distro, or build it. And are there any plans to add additional file system supports in, in addition to ZFS and, and LDISCFS? So we had, we, we had that discussion, actually, because we talked about ButterFS. But ButterFS seems to be on life support. Um, probably the most logical choice, if wanted to do that, would be XFS. That seems to be the one that's commonly used. Uh, but there's been no effort to do that. Uh, like I said, the, the love affair is ZFS. And uh, uh, to the point that I am actually starting to get involved in ZFS development, my, my boss, yeah, my boss has told me, he said, you need to do that too now. <laughs> so, so now I'm expanding into that file system. And uh, so, so that is the, the goal. And uh, so that is to make life easier, like I said. More talent, um, it comes automatically. You don't have to do your own packaging or anything like that anymore. It'll make life a lot easier. Uh, anytime the kernel gets updated now, 
Luster struggles to update to these newer kernels, and it's not the highest priority. Somebody else will do it for us. Um, usually Alvira or that will come along and say, oh, here's a patch. This will make it work on the newer kernels with the changes. Because anyone who's worked with the kernel knows the internals change all the time. That is like the hardest thing to deal with, actually. Another one, what InfiniBand driver are you using? Are you using MoFed or OFED? I'm using MoFed. We love MoFed. <laughs> right, and from what I've heard from people is that um, when they try and build Luster with MoFed, they get nothing but severe heartburn. Yes, the, but this is much better. Actually, in 2.13, we're up to a 5.3 kernel support. And the reason we're doing that is because there's a big effort. So while we're pushing the, the Luster client upstream, it's already in the works to push the server upstream. So the window between the two is going to be a year or less. It so does that mean then once it's all upstream, you get away from this supposed kernel tainting issue with Luster? The, what do you mean tainting? There's not really tainting. Right, but there are certain distros that claim that it dilutes their kernel, et cetera, in, in one shape or another, and which is one reason why they don't want to touch Luster with a barge file. I have to, I, I want to know more about that one is, and who said that. It's the server? Yes, that is a thing. Yeah, you don't have to patch kernels anymore or anything like that. Well, technically RHEL 7 because of a project quota, because RHEL 7 kernels are really old, so sometimes you have to patch them. And sometimes we had to patch them because they were just broken. <laughs> so I just want to do an acknowledgement, and this was all performed. You know, it's all funded by the OS. You're, you're, you're tax-paying dollars, if you're American, <laughs> 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 by the DOE, and this is the, it's our computing facility. That's what we do. We're very unique in this. Is um, like Livermore does uh, ZFS development. They're heavily in that, and, Lust and Oak Ridge does heavily in, in Luster development. So each site has their contributions. Yep. And that's our even our IE. I have to put up the contract number. And that's it. So yeah, I had a quick question. Uh, so you said on ARM's um, so Luster server on ARM works with ZFS no problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was RHEL 7.6, right? Yes, that's what I've been testing it on. Okay, uh, ZFS ZFS with SPL or ZFS? Latest? I've done. I've moved to eight. So so there's a caveat to that because I've done it. <laughs> so ZFS seven is it works with SP and the SPL and um, and 8 does too as well. In fact, I found from my, our testing, we run ZFS. ZFS 8 is way better than 7. When we tried 7, we were losing MD, our, our metadata servers. They were crashing, and it was just a complete mess. Um, so then we moved to 8. Works flawlessly for us. So um, WAM Cloud, they moved their infrastructure to doing ZFS 8 their tests were failing. And the reason is because ZFS has gotten hungrier, and so one of the tests is to see how much you know, block space has been consumed between runs. And they found that like three times the amount of block space was being consumed with the same run ver versus the seven version. And, I, and I, I, I know Brian Beldendorf that does ZFS personally, and I talked to him about it. He said, well, that might be the project quoted, but we, we really don't know why that's doing that. It shouldn't be doing that. but. That's what it is. So they had a rollback. You can build with it and run it in production, but be aware that it's going to consume more space on your backend storage. And it's going to show up. And we don't know why that is at currently. So so do we have performance numbers? I can collect them, but
but I have not done that, actually. So our test bed is small. This is the, this is the hard thing, is like, unless <coughs> somebody wants to no donate <coughs> hardware, <laughs> we don't have, <laughs> we only have a couple nodes. I mean, we have like four nodes, and then we have like 10 nodes. And then the problem is, is nobody will let me take all the hardware. Uh, this, I have to share, and <laughs> <laughs> this is the biggest problem. It's like, can I have all the notes? No, somebody else is using it for their project. Is that Wombat is it something yeah, Wombat's one of them. Because what happened is it became a semi-production machine, and people run their application code, so I just can't like, oh, I'm going to take it away from the users. I'm going to break everything. So it has to be semi-stable. and. Uh, Yeah, that's, so need I need hardware, and I need dedicated high-performance hardware with baseline. Yeah, I need a system for that, like you said. And also, like you said, I need to have a, a tool, a sy system set up, open MPI that runs jobs, and are tuned for that to see what they would do. Because that's, that's also in the works. I'll, th this is a moving platform. So you referenced Brist uh, Bristol. Mm -hmm. um, the Catalyst program, you know, Leicester, Edinburgh, Bristol, all have the full production Apollo 70s, and they're anxious to be using Leicester. So I don't know if you're plugged in with that group at all, but um, that would be a means for you to get uh, much more interesting physical configurations. I know it wouldn't be at Oral, but it would help the community a lot. That's good to know. So I didn't know if they ended up, so they've never deployed a file system yet? They are, uh, they're working hard at it, uh, and it's less uh, 15 with MoFed, and so they're actually in process of rebuilding okay, for so that integration, so um, we can help make some connections there. But that Yeah, help them connect, because that's the crowd I don't know very well. Like Sandia, I know all the players, but. Right. Yeah. Okay. And I'm always open to helping other sites. So I've had this discussion with work, and uh, I'd have to talk to my manager about the situation. There's, there's all these issues with that. Um, it's, it's hard to explain, but there's like, we have to look look like we're not favoring anyone or anything like that. There's all these rules, and I don't even know all the. I mean, I I I know enough to not do anything and ask my boss. <laughs> <laughs> I do get. I have to do training for these rules and and stuff. So, so, and I know some of the rules, but I I know I have an understanding of the rules enough to like not do anything on my own initiative. So I would. If someone approaches me and they say, yeah, they want this, I'll go to my boss and we can discuss it and work with our legal department. And I have two questions. Uh, first of all, you would like to uh, uh, test and verify what kind of the boot, okay, uh, you would like to have, like either the Linux boot or the UEFI or, or, or what? Or, or any, do you have any preference? Oh, so. You know, I've seen some crazy configurations out there for the boot, and I think these are, usually we try to do diskless setups with Puppet. That's usually what we try to do. I think Wombat is, is actually diskful, and if I remember right. Is it diskful? Yeah, it's one of those special cases. Normally we do these diskless images and we boot them up in these images. Mm. Yeah, because uh, uh, the Linux boot may address some of your concern. The mm -hmm. reason for the Linux because it bear it not, and then the open source boot not like the UEFI is a is kind of proprietary. Yeah. yeah. The other thing I found is that um, 
on rail systems, you really have to use ACPI, some kind of emulation mode. It will not work. <laughs> we tried device tree with rail, and that was, that was painful. <laughs> so that's the only thing you have to be careful for. SUSE works, device tree works fine. That's another pain point. I don't know why systems do this. It's rel, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know who John Masters is. <laughs> okay. You have connection to people like Ast on Astronaut. Yes. You should be able to get the performance of the client because I know it's run on every node there. So the thing with performance on production machines, I know this from personal experience, is that there's a lot of noise because people are on the system with you. And that's the hard thing. Is, is h so usually, like at Ornell, we would take these downtimes, like during maintenance windows, replace broken hardware. You know, we have hardware failure. That would be when, as soon as the hardware got repaired, we would reboot and we would do all these number runs to make sure everything's okay. And then we would return it to the user. And that's, that's how we historically have done this. So, but we just get these narrow windows, so the only way I could do that is if they would let me on their system. And then there's also the issue of like, I could run as a normal user. I don't think I need to do root on that, usually I don't. I try to avoid having root. It's, it's, it's too much responsibility, I don't want that. Yeah. Anything else?